Welcome to season 10 of the Parenting Aces podcast, part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and we've got another great episode for you this week. We are going to be talking with Coach Bill Patton. I'll tell you a little bit about Bill in just a moment. For those of you new to the podcast and may not have heard him before on this show, but before I bring Bill on and give you that uh, little background info on him, I want to just remind you, if you haven't become a premium member of Parenting Aces, yet. We'd love to have you on board. You can just go to parentingaces.com and click on the link. Also, we've got our merch online. So we'd love for you to, excuse me, go shopping. Oh my goodness. I've got a little frog in my throat. throat) Sorry about that. Um, We'd love for you to go shopping on the website, buy some of our cool merch. We've got hats and shirts and tanks and uh, all with our cool new logo. So rock the Parenting Aces garb and uh, take your pride out there. So let me give you a little bit of info on Coach Bill Patton. He is a lifetime USTA member. He's a senior contributor to Sports Ed TV, part of the leadership group behind the Winning Summit, uh, which is an online uh, summit, uh, uh, coaching summit for uh, all sorts of things having to do with junior tennis, collegiate tennis, tennis development, professional tennis, et cetera, et cetera. He's also behind the Evolutionary Sports Collective. Bill's got his hands in everything. He has been a certified tennis professional. I think he has kind of uh, let that one go, but he and I co-authored a book and Bill has authored several other books, all of which are available on Amazon, on our website, under our books links. So hope you'll take a look for all of those. And this week, Bill and I are going to be talking about all kinds of stuff around junior tennis. Um, There is no junior tennis conversation without addressing cheating, of course, especially when Bill's on, because one of the things that Bill specializes in is visual training. And I always love hearing his perspective on the difficulties and challenges that young players have calling balls correctly on the tennis court. So without further ado, let me unmute Bill. Let me add him to the shot. Uh, For those of you listening to this, I hope you'll check out the video version on our website and on our YouTube channel. Bill, good morning. How are you? Good morning. How are you, Lisa? It's good to see you. It's good to see you too. We've um, scheduled this and rescheduled this and vacations have come into play and COVID and God knows what else, but glad to have you and uh, so glad we could finally make this work. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, I'll trade you a book for a t-shirt. Oh, you got it. Okay, deal. Yeah, yeah, yep. you got she it. She was yep. vulnerable. I mean, how, how is she going to say no? Anyway. <laughs> hey, any opportunity for somebody to rock the Parenting Aces garb, I'm up for it. Um, you'll yep. have to just email me your mailing address and I will get that off to you. All right, life, vice versa. Yep, perfect. So tell us what's going on in the world of Bill Patton. Um, I I see you everywhere. You're doing a Monday morning radio show. Uh, You're doing all kinds of stuff these days. Yeah, yeah. Well, people uh, live with this uh, false belief that somehow I'm busy all the time, but they haven't seen me laying on the couch. So, Well, there's um, a lot that you can do laying on the couch these days. Well, okay. There's that too. So... um, (laughs) Well, all right. What's currently happening right now is I'm getting uh, more deeply involved in researching neuroscience, which is a baby science. It's really brand new, the the in-depth study of the brain. And so much is still not understood. So it's a pretty daunting thing to get into. Um, But that's, that's kind of a big emphasis right now i am currently editing the complete guide to coaching team tennis that i created with david smith um and uh also uh just finished publishing the fourth edition of visual training for tennis awesome and so that just came out in may so i'm i'm right now i'm sort of touring a little bit and um and you know doing some book signings and and all that and trying to be on as many podcasts to talk about it as possible so thank you for the opportunity glad so, to be a stop uh, on your media tour oh yes so it's like <laughs> you know and and then you know i get to sit on my couch while i do this so See? That's, that's important right there you go I'll, you in a moment very, i'm gonna be like that you can be very productive from the couch i have learned that i think we've all learned that well during covid 
So talk to us a little bit. I mentioned in the intro that you can't have a conversation about junior tennis without talking about cheating and, and cheating and visual training for you go hand in hand, because I think the whole prevalence of cheating in junior tennis may have led you to kind of look into this whole notion of how people see the ball and training how people see the ball and uh, see the lines and all of those things. So maybe give us a little bit of your story around that. Yeah, no, I, I, it's funny because I hadn't thought about it that way until just now, but I guess there's some credence to that. So l let's start with a story. And I don't, I don't want to talk too long about cheating because no. it's, it, it gets emotional. And so I am not emotional about cheating. It's a problem and I solve problems. And so uh, I would encourage everyone to be a problem solver. So when you, when you, you know, throw your hands up in the air and say, it's an unsolvable problem, then you just made it permanent. So right. be a problem solver. So here's an interesting story. Um, I was tournament director, I was watching this one particular match and uh, the is a young boy and he's his dad is Eastern European uh, I found out later they're from Bosnia and you know dad's pretty gruff and and all that and but you know a decent guy nice guy and his son's playing and the son proceeds to make at least nine bad calls in the Oof. match Oof. nine at least nine right so I'm watching this match with great curiosity and I can't coach the other player to get a lines person that's right. not in my purview but i'm watching and waiting and waiting and waiting and the other kid never calls for a lines person but i was studying this kid i was watching him very closely because because mostly what cheaters do is right after they make the eye the the bad call they avoid all eye contact <laughs> with everyone right you see them yes. go through this transformation of of a lack of transparency. They don't want to look at anybody because they don't want to see who saw. Uh -huh. right? So this kid did not have that. He had no guile, right? So I'm like, what's going on here with this kid? And I'm looking over at the dad and every time the kid makes a bad call, the dad sort of winces. And I'm like, okay, well, dad's not on board with this. So, mm -hmm. huh, what's, what exactly is going on here, right? So the match is over and the kids, he's very pleasant. He's very pleasant. He's very enthusiastic. He's, he says nice shot to his opponent when the opponent makes a nice shot. So, so after the match, um, I, I went to the dad and I said, Hey, can we have a, can we have a chat for a moment after the match, after your son comes off and reports his score? And he says, and he's like, he thinks he's in trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I pulled him aside and I said, you know, sir, I think you've done an amazing job. You know, your son just looks like a really delightful boy and all that. But I, I saw you looking very uncomfortable when he made some errors with his calls, which I think we both saw, right? So will you do me a favor and take him to go see the eye doctor, mm. right? Um, and w that runs counter to what we normally do. We just Right. label the kid a cheater and now he's a cheater from now on and all we want to do is see him punished yeah that's all that's all yeah. just punish him right throw him out um so anyway so it, a couple of months and then the, the dad's you know looking confused and he's you know wasn't ready for this conversation and then i didn't think it went really well um but it's a couple of months later and i'm at a tournament with my juniors and all of a sudden the dad's running up to me really fast and I'm bracing myself because I don't know what's about to happen. I, I'm ready. I'm ready to possibly fight. Okay. So Gosh. no, I mean, I don't start them, but I will continue them anyway. So, <laughs> so he runs up to me and then he says, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I took my son to the eye doctor. It turns out he needs glasses. Now he plays with contacts and he's playing better. Wow. Right. So, okay. So that's one, that's throwing one starfish back into the sea. Right. Yep. So if we do it that way, if we go, all right, one at a time, we will, you know, go on a case by case basis, figure out what's going on there and mm -hmm. deal with it. Then mm -hmm. we can solve it. You know, my, my book is called, um, you know, uh, how to, how to, 
how to end cheating in junior tennis. Uh, 21 ways to eat the elephant. Yeah. Right. Because we, we're going to do it one bite at a time. And essentially it comes down to this. And I think this is what people lack. They lack moral courage. They lack the ability to stand up and say, this is a problem and we're going to deal with it and we're going to do it right now. Right. And so my tournaments became known as tournaments where cheating didn't happen as much. And many times I got this compliment from parents. It was so nice to know that the people who won deserve to win. That's a nice compliment. Well, and so but then I became a pariah in my section because <laughs> because I pissed off the wrong people because mm. because the powerful political people were also cheaters. Mm. And so then after a while, I had to stop running tournaments because I was running the gauntlet. I was a target yeah. for criticism and people would make up accusations for me to defend myself against. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, you know, fold uh, you know i'm just gonna go yeah. someplace else and do something else so well but, here's, but the nice here's what, thing bill yeah. nice the nice thing now is we have alternatives right we have all sorts of ways for kids to compete in our sport that don't solely revolve around the governing body there are still opportunities through the governing body but then there are opportunities elsewhere as well that sometimes are are a lot better opportunities for these kids to become their best tennis self. Yes. Well, and yeah, absolutely. And in my experience, and in, this is not the highest levels. I mean, I ran open level tournaments in NorCal. So, you know, d decent level players who are on their way up, you know, mm -hmm. um, but not national level events. But in my experience, 80% of the bad calls that are made are simply mistakes. Mm -hmm. it's just hard to see a ball going 80 miles an hour that way, you know, when your head's turning and it's yes. very close to the line. So simple mistake, right? About 15% of the mistakes are because someone's feeling so much pressure from their parents or their coach or whatever, that they're psychologically blinded. Their, their, their brain lies to them. Mm. They, they mean well, but there's they but their eyes lie to them and they it tells them what they want to hear yeah. and then about one in 20 is criminal because their coach told them that if it's break point and the ball's on the line you Out. take it yeah you know so uh you yeah. know i think the percentage is probably different at at higher levels event events but that's well that's but a, yeah but ahead. i want to just ask you because you talk about the fact that you know, you're running, you were running events for kids that were on their way up. They weren't national level players. This is the, the, the bunch of the tennis playing population right now that really seems to be left out of the mix. And so, you know, I'm hoping that people that are watching or listening to this are hearing this. The fact that you were running events for that mid-range player. These are the players that typically tend to become lifelong players mm. who tend to introduce their children to the sport, who tend to introduce their friends and partners to the sport. And we need them. We need mm -hmm. to keep them engaged. And right now at the national governing body, those are the players who are being kept out of competitive play. And so again, thankfully we have lots of alternatives available now. And part of my challenge with parenting aces is making sure people know about these alternatives that, yeah. you know, there are chances for their kids to continue to compete and grow and and develop and love the game yeah so i will make this offer anybody anyone who wants to consult with how to solve this problem in their area whether they're a sectional representative or a tournament director or an influential parent i will consult with you about first steps to start to making things go the other way and i will say this that 
so many kids drop out of of junior tennis because there are what sixty thousand junior tennis players are maybe declining. And, declining. But there are three hundred and forty thousand high school tennis players right. and growing. So that's where they end up. And then it's funny how in a team situation the uh, the cheating aspect can be mitigated much more easily because sure. because there is an onus placed on getting real lines people on there for the remainder of the match. Well, so, and also there's peer pressure amongst your teammates, right? So there are yes. lots of people holding you accountable for those calls. Mm -hmm. But okay, so you offered this consultation. I want to just say, check out the show notes to those of you watching or listening. Uh, we'll have links to contact Bill in the show notes via email, phone. I'm not sure what he's going to share with us, but make sure you check out the show notes for that contact info. Moral courage. There you go. I love that term, actually, moral courage. And, yeah. you know, I want to go back you. to your story for one second because listening to it, and I, it's not the first time I've heard that story from you, but um, listening to it, you know, one thing that crops into my head is you said the dad was standing there watching and wincing every time his son would make a bad call. But what you didn't say is whether anybody intervened and how the opponent was handling the bad calls. And so can you just quickly talk about what you feel the parent's role is when they're standing courtside seeing their child making these bad calls? Mm. Well, first I want to make another comment because I did run other tournaments that were not USTA tournaments where I was free to do as I wish. <laughs> and there was uh -oh. a time <laughs> and there was a time that I went out on the court and I spoke directly to a player in between points. Mm. And I said, get it together. Yeah. <laughs> Your father has given me permission to come speak to you. Mm. Get it together now or mm -hmm. you will be penalized. And, mm -hmm. and that's not something you could do at a USDA event. And right. the kid made a turnaround and ended up winning the tournament. And then we were able to praise him for mm -hmm. his remarkable growth. But anyway, um, yeah, it's hard. And I've been the parent and I've been the pissed off parent. I've been the furious parent, right? Who's, yeah. who's kids being cheated and you go and you inform, you know, the tournament desk that there's a problem on a court and they don't come. Because it's not our role as parents to report come. it. They right. don't the kids come. have to ask. And then eventually the roving umpire gets there and you go, hey, uh, take a look right there, right? Yeah. And then, you know, they go on the court for two games and they don't see anything. And so they just presume that everything's okay. So right. that is the antithesis of moral courage. Yeah. Now, what we did at our tournaments is this i had teenagers as court roving monitors on court with walkie talkies mm. they would see one bad call and they would call me immediately and then i would go to that court yeah and they had permission to look at the player that had made the bad call and continue looking at them mm. which right? You know, is tricky too because it can be interpreted as intimidation. And um, looking is just looking. They weren't I, to scowl at them. They yeah. weren't to stare at them. They were just to right. look at them. And it's amazing what that did to curtail cheating. Yeah. And then, then a, a nonverbal message is sent. Wait a minute. I just made a bad call, and three minutes later, the tournament director's watching my match. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. Yeah. 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 But again, getting back to what the yeah. parents role is in that situation, I, I think, I, you know, because this is parenting aces. Right. Well, I would say, number one, you really need to be calm, cool and collected. You have to accept the current state mm. as, as it is today, because because when you go to the tournament, then then you have to accept the way they're running it at that moment. But then after they fail, then what you really ought to do is write a very good letter. So um, I would say first step would be go to the desk, inform them that there's a problem on a court. Would they please look? 
right? If they fail to do that, right, then that's going to become part of the letter that you write. Except I'm talking about the parent of the kid making the bad calls. I'm talking about oh. the, the dad you were referring to who would wince every time he would see his son make a bad call. What What is his role? What's his responsibility in the moment? I think that, that you know, that's interesting because um, I think just unfortunately, the the current situation is that we're just not very mindful about this stuff at all. It's just the status quo. He, he, but we need to talk he, about it. We need to well, become mindful here, because there are parents who have said, you know, I yanked my kid off the court when they did stuff like that. And, well, and I've said often, I wish I had listened to my husband and yanked our kid off the court, not for cheating. That wasn't his thing, but it was more the yeah. temper. Right. Um, but so, right. you know, but the rules so empower, don't allow the rules yeah. do not allow the parents to get involved at all. Well, see, that's where moral courage comes in. So what yes. why did why we wrote rules that were that were ineffective because we lacked the moral courage to do the right thing. Right. So in these non-USTA events, I went to this parent and I said, you see how your son's acting? And the parent and the parent said, do whatever you want within reason. And mm -hmm. I said, okay, <laughs> trust me, I will. Yeah. So what, we, what, what they did is they legislated themselves away from courage. They, didn't, they now don't have to do anything. So I would say that parent of that kid, um, there are any number of strategies that you can use. You can film their matches and show them back to them later and say, look, that ball was in, that ball was in, that ball was in. And, you know, and, and say, you know, I feel embarrassed when you make incorrect calls. You mm -hmm. know, this is not how we play. And as a high school coach, I have made it very firm that with my players, we're going to play fair, even if the other team doesn't. Because what they're telling you when they cheat is that they don't think they're good enough to beat you fairly. Mm -hmm. So, so it will, it, uh, they will succumb to their own cheating mm -hmm. and we will do better by playing fair because we will play from confidence. So, I mean, I, I think it's really important to take the long view of the character development of the players because now, See, there's this, there's this culture that's been developed where, oh, that player's good, so you must not get, teach them any character skills because that will sidetrack their playing level. Yeah, what's that about? No, and it's, it's deeply ingrained, and I've heard this from officials above me. Oh, so-and-so is a good player. I'm like, well, but they cheat like hell, so I don't care. Yeah. Right. So, but they're, they're going nowhere because they will be exposed. And when they can't cheat to win anymore, their game's going to implode. Mm -hmm. So, huh. So yeah. what, I wonder why we're not developing so many, as many great players these days. It's because we're driving away kids with good character and we're promoting the ones with bad character. Interesting. Because they're good. You know? yeah. and, that, and so, no, not really. Right. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So I know we said we weren't going to spend a lot of time on cheating <laughs> and now we're 23 minutes in and that's, that's all we've okay. talked about. We'll okay. fly through the rest of it. Okay, good. Let's fly through the rest of it. So transitioning into this whole notion of visual training and what the role is and what it can do for players. Go. Yes. Well, um, a, it's it's trainable you can train your eyes and i am 57 years old and because of the responsibility of being a good example for visual training i have begun to train my eyes and it's been amazing <laughs> because you know even at you know i'm not young and i've been really working hard to train my eyes and now all of a sudden i can't miss so my lessons are better and my giving my players better workouts and I'm having less arm pain because I'm, I'm hitting the ball more cleanly. So your eyes are trainable. So there's a, 
misconception that your vision is your vision and you can't change it, but that mm -hmm. is false. You can. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one and thing. It's it's not just a matter of getting contacts or glasses because oftentimes it really doesn't have anything to do with having 20, 20 vision. It's the way your eyes track, right. And what you're yes. focusing on. And, and so let's, let's talk about that bill, because I, that's what I find so interesting about this, that it's not, you know, necessarily a function of, of again, whether or not you have 20, 20 vision, but, training yourself to look differently at the court, at the ball, at the strings, at the opponent, all of those things. Right. Well, and that brings us to another misconception, and that is that everyone sees the same. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Cheryl Calder, who I just recently had an hour long interview with, she's perhaps the most, she's the preeminent expert on visual training. She's working with Liverpool, Chelsea, uh, F1, Formula One drivers, uh, wow. some professional tennis players. And um, she's tested over 100,000 athletes and found that no two have the same strengths and weaknesses visually. Hmm. So uh, no two people see the same. So, so we have this presumption that we, that we can you can project our visual ability onto someone else. Why can't you see that? Right. Yeah. So um, it's like that, so, that dress color thing that went around the internet a couple years ago, mm -hmm. like is the dress blue or black or whatever. Right. Yeah. 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 So it's so no two people see the same. And so it's really important to understand that you're going to have strengths and weaknesses. And if you, if you know your strengths, you can operate out of them. And if you um, can mitigate your weaknesses and yeah. improve them, then you're going to see much better. So that's a just a like really with your tennis thing. strokes, just like with your tennis strokes. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So um, like, for instance, there's the, an app on the Apple store. I'm not sure if it's on if it's an Android app as well, but it's called Hawkeye. Um, not to be confused with, you know, uh, the line calling, shot, the line calling thing, but yeah. it's, it's a really amazing and simple app that, uh, gives you patterns of lines and, and it varies between being pretty easy and extremely difficult. And the, li the lines go in different directions and you have to choose which one, which one it is. And I'll tell you what, a five minute workout with that is exhausting. Hmm. Is it so, a free app, Bill? It is a free app. Okay. Um, and then let me see. We'll link I've, to it in the show notes too. Yes. And one thing I've recently also begun doing is I've I've bought some eye patches because um, eye occlusion training is amazing. So you you can just put an put an eye patch over your dominant eye for about five minutes and just go about your regular regular activities, and your non-dominant eye is going to get a workout. So. So and we the, talked the about way, the dominant yeah, versus non-dominant in the last podcast we did together, which again, I'll, I'll put a link to that one in the, in the show notes yeah. too. But I, that whole notion of dominant and non-dominant eye, I think is very, very interesting. And it was something that I was first taught about when I took a lesson in Mallorca, Spain on the red clay. Mm. And I had never heard anything about that, but. The That's Spaniards, the first thing they do. They identify your dominant eye. That's the very first step in, in coaching a, a young player. Was Miguel Crespo around? Not, no, that's not okay, who taught but me, but maybe no, he coached. The Spaniards, especially involved with ITF education, are way ahead of everybody when it comes to laterality. So laterality is the dominance of things throughout your body, right? Okay. So you've got right eye, left mm -hmm. eye right shoulder, left shoulder, right hip, left hip, spin preference, you know, hands, mm -hmm. feet. Um, so that, and that can zigzag through your body or it can make a straight line or something in between. So uh, all those things make a difference, but let's, let's go to, let's go to 30,000 feet for a second. Um, so here's a question for you. We'll give you the quick quiz. Uh, what okay. percentage of your brain's activity centers around your vision? Ooh, I, I'm going to say 
25 percent 60 percent what yes and no other sense has more than 10 percent of brain activity associated with it so it's the thing that your brain is most busy doing all right so now seeing seeing and then uh, somewhere around 80 percent of that is processed by your dominant eye got it so 48 percent approximately of your brain's activity is coming through your dominant eye so it's important to know which one it is mm -hmm. and to intentionally look through it and then also to train your non-dominant eye to track better with your with your dominant eye so i recently had something interesting happen i went to the optometrist for the first time since before covid um just to check my prescription and it turns out i need a contact only in one eye mm. so i guess my other eye is my dominant eye i don't know but i thought that was I mean, it's the first time in my adult life wearing glasses or contacts that i've been told you only need one Yes. Well, it's possible. It's actually possible that you might reverse that. So, um, so if you yeah. really get busy exercising your eyes, you might find that you can exercise. You yeah. can do that. So you have the list of bullet points, and I don't. So oh. <laughs> keep, I'll keep you. Okay. So keep, um, keep me going. One of the things we that you wanted to kind of touch on is the five misconceptions about vision. Right. We already so handled one of them. We handled one. Um, one of the things that you point out is that you should keep your eye on the ball and you should always focus on the ball. So. Oh, no, you no. Keep your eye on the ball and watch the ball and focusing on the ball at, at all times. Those are misconceptions. Right. 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 Okay. All right, right. Why? Why are okay. there misconceptions? Because well, okay. it's what so, we were all taught. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. <laughs> and. The reason why my pet theory on the reason why people have been successful is because they learned their own way. Mm -hmm. So the coach said that, and then you had to figure out how to do it on your own because the teaching taught you nothing. But even Bill, if we listen to commentary when we're watching the pros, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're I, laughing. I, I, know. Know where, I know where you're going. And okay, okay let's just go forward because I think that'll answer your question. Yeah, so, okay, yeah. keep your eye on the ball means almost nothing, right? And but what it leads to is too much pinpoint vision, and then you get saccadic motion of the eye, and then what's that's that where mean? you wait, what's that's where the mean? eyes shake when they move sideways. Okay, so people try so hard to keep their eye on the ball that their eyes shake. And this is where you have that experience where, you know, you're at the net, you're, you're volleying, it's quick action, you're keeping your eye on the ball, and then you lose sight of it and you hit the volley in the net and you think that something's wrong with you. You, what's wrong with me? I, yeah. I was keeping my eye on the ball. And, and, but it doesn't work anatomically. And so you, because you're not doing what really works, that's why you missed. Mm -hmm. And then you use it as an opportunity to beat yourself up as I used to, right? Mm -hmm. So once you start to realize that instead of keep your eye on the ball, what you should do is trust your brain's ability to reconcile that blurring object into your strings. Keep your head relatively still and, and let that blur go there. It's really amazing. I mean, in mm -hmm. generally in less than a minute i can get people hitting volleys with the ball just dead center of the strings almost every time wow um and then watch the ball is non-specific so watch the ball and it's actually insulting because i remember as a kid having people say watch the ball watch the ball and i'm like but i am you think yeah. i'm not what 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 kind of idiot do you think I am? You just said it five <laughs> minutes ago. I'm doing it right. So so it doesn't mean anything, but it it is insulting, um, and I think everybody can relate to that. But here's the thing: what do you want to do instead? Give it a where and when, because if you have a where and when to what you're describing, then it works because your brain processes where and when like that.
Give us an example so, of what you mean. See the ball coming out of the opponent's racket. That is a where and a when because okay. it's when they hit it mm. and it's at the contact point. Yeah. And so if if you can't go wrong if what you're teaching is a where and a when. Okay. Right. Uh, I also teach that the backswing starts sometime around the bounce of the ball. So if the ball's coming faster, you might start your backswing before it's bounced. If it's coming bounced slower, on your side of the court, bounced on saying. your side. This is for ground mm -hmm. strokes, right? Mm -hmm. And so if it's coming slower, then you might start your backswing slightly after the bounce. But the reference point is the bounce of the ball. And so then that gives a really nice timing mechanism. And you know, go watch some pro tennis and go watch how they per how when do they initiate their backswing on their shots, and it's right around that time. So, and the cool thing is, Bill, now that we have so much technology available to us, just as lay people, um, you're a coach, a professional coach, I'm a lay person, um, but I can go online and watch slow motion video of pretty much any player I want at any tournament on any surface, and I can look for these exact things that you're referencing. I can yes. look for when they start their backswing. I can look for... Uh, where their eyes are focused, um, you know, on a particular stroke or point. And so there are ways to really reinforce these messages other than just the doing of it on the court itself. Yes, absolutely. And here's, here's a thing to do. This is be a fun thing. Watch, look at the difference between the way Serena sees the ball and the way Federer does, because, um, I believe Serena is pure dextral and uh, and Federer is cross dextral. And so Serena and Andre Agassi and many others look at a place ahead of the contact point. Mm. And pure dextral people are better guided to actually watch the ball all the way into the strings, but it doesn't work so well for pure dextral. So uh, we better keep moving. Okay. What's next? So, okay. What are the mental and emotional factors in visual performance? Um, well, there's this thing called the affective filter. And so when, and it affects processing. So it's if, something in your brain. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it affects your intellectual, you know, mental and emotional processing of information that you're getting. Okay. So when anxiety levels are high, processing is mitigated it's really hard to process things when you are anxious mm -hmm. and so so best practices for coaches and parents and players is to create the lowest anxiety entry to practice that you can um so i think a lot of much people easier said than done well i mean i don't know i mean you know hi how you doing right yeah. People come in the court, hey, come on in, right? right. Um, I don't know how many times a first lesson will show up late. And so then they're, you know, they're late for their first lesson. They got to meet, you know, a new weirdo, you know, <laughs> at a strange place they've never been before. And they're late. And now they're worried about being judged and blah, blah, blah. And so I'm like, so I start them with this. Hi, how you doing? Hey, are you a little wound up? You know, just calm down, calm down. And then remember, attendance is attendance is optional, but payment is mandatory, right? <laughs> so just calm down, you know, slow yourself down because yeah. let's let's have a really good lesson. Because if you if you're going like this, it's just not even going to be sure. a good for it won't be a good forty five minutes, and we want to get the most out of it. So right um, now, as training continues, then coaches who've gained the trust of players can create even higher higher anxiety situations so that the players can train being right. calm when the crowd is against them, right? And all these things. So, so you start, but you want to start with a very welcoming, low-key, easygoing entree and then you can just slowly ramp up the challenge level and you know and then find the breaking point and work there to learn the skills of being keeping your calm 
because calmness, your mental state has a lot to do with the clarity of how well you're going to see. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things I want to say is and, and kind of highlight is the fact that you're talking about training high stress situations. We can't expect our kids to go into a tournament and handle the pressure of competition, the pressure of trying to win, the pressure of, you know, outside influences that may be happening around the court if they haven't properly trained those things ahead of time. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've seen it with my own kid where, you know, he wasn't working on those types of things in his training and then would get into a tournament and it's, it's that story of my kid plays so well in practice and then they get to a tournament and they can't play at all. You know, they yeah, look like they've yeah. never picked up a racket. Well, look, it's because they haven't trained these things. Right. I mean, you have well, to train them. As a high school coach, I would sit in the parking lot and I would wait for my players to be hitting a second serve and then I would honk the horn. There you go. And so they would have to learn how to concentrate. And I'll tell you what, it is... I don't think anybody can serve more than 20% for serves if when, if when their toss comes up goes up you say monkey <laughs> No <laughs> very so so that's when I know people are really ready is they can they can pass the monkey test That's um, a good one So you know and then you know I mean it t it takes a certain special trust level to um, take them through sort of a little role play of, of you know, being the abusive coach for a yeah. little bit to, to steal their, their will, right? So, I mean, I've been known to ask people, ask players what's wrong with them, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, they, then they, they also start laughing because they know I'm not really genuinely... But, but, but we do me, this. Let we, me just add something yeah. to that, though, Bill. And I, I am all in favor of that, of you know, creating situations in practice that a player is maybe going to face in competition and helping them learn how to deal with that. Yeah. However, I will tell you, as the parent sitting on the sideline, you need to tell me you're doing that because <laughs> otherwise my stress level is through the roof, right? So right. There has to be a social situation. contract established. Yes, so, yes. Um, yes. My parents are usually pretty entertained because they know what's happening right. and it's, I'm mostly doing that to teenagers and it's sort of payback for all that to other teenager <laughs> behavior. Well, so, like yeah. I said, if we know the reason behind it, yes. all good, right? right? If we're all on the same page. But That's if we're a great sitting point. There, yeah, we should get you know, moving. What's the next one? Okay, so the next one is, what's the worst visual performance you've seen? Oh, do I even remember what that was? What was the first? I worst don't know, it was your bullet point, Bill. <laughs> it was my bullet point. Maybe. Huh. We're gonna have to move past that one. I'll, I'll, if okay. I can remember it, I'll go back to it. But okay. You know. What are the default modalities of thought that comprise visual performance? Yeah, it's really interesting to me how nearly one hundred percent of the players who come to me for their first lesson are they're actively trying to figure out what's wrong. They're using their eyes to analyze their performance and detect errors to correct. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then the other thing that they're doing is they're creating checklists of things that need to be done for a stroke to be executed. And so while they're doing that, they're taking, they're taking blood flow away yeah. from the part of the brain that actually does it and they, yeah. they're not able to see the ball. And then by the time they've gotten to point three, the ball's already gone. And then they work their way into frustration. So they've clouded their minds with too many thoughts. So, right. so I see paralysis by analysis. I see checklist building. I see subjective judgments, good shot, bad shot right mm -hmm. dope dopamine fix followed by double fault right yeah. so yeah. i mean th this is one of the big solutions to that phenomenon of ace followed by double fault mm. um because because that when you are having feelings of elation then you're getting a dopamine fix which then clouds your vision and makes you temporarily uncoordinated so you need that cleansing breath to get that out of there 
and you need to talk yourself back into being ready for the next point and fully engaged. So, I mean, you don't see the very top players going, woohoo, you know, after an ace at 3 2 in the second set. Right. I mean, they'll do it at towards the climax of the match when it's, you know, winning a set or something like that. They will allow that, but they're going to they're going to delay their gratification because all of that has an effect on your visual system. All right. Well, so it's all about maintaining kind of an equilibrium throughout the match and not allowing things like dopamine to get in the way of performance. Um, because I, as you just explained, when your body produces dopamine, you're, you're in a temporary state of paralysis. You, your brain's not functioning at full capacity. Your vision's not functioning at full capacity. So we don't want those dopamine influxes in the midst except, of competition. Well, except, no, I think we do want the dopamine. We, we you will have the dopamine. It's okay. going to happen. You're going to have elation. What do you do with it? You you take a deep breath because because you don't you want have to, it to affect you. Yeah, you, do, you but you want that. That's why you play. It's for the fun. It's for the emotion, <laughs> right? And okay. then, like, here's another great example. Um, Agassi was up. Um, it was it was set a piece, and Agassi was up a break in the third set against Federer at the U.S. Open. Okay. And they played a 25-shot rally, won by Agassi on a break point or something. And the New York crowd's going nuts, yeah. right? And during that moment, not seen by very many people, Federer did a Klingon death cry. <laughs> he was like, yeah! Right? Yeah. And so what did that do? He, he engaged himself emotionally fully into that match. Then he let it go, and then he won 21 of the next 25 points. Wow. I mean, he turned what was looking like he was going to lose the third set into a decisive four-set victory. Hmm. And so, so, yeah, I mean, emotional engagement also helps, helps you to get your awareness and your alertness to a certain level. So it's generally true that you want to be more calm and serene before serving, and you want to be more activated and alert before returning. Interesting. Okay. So what's next? All right. Um, what are the, did I just ask you this? What are the default modalities of thought? Oh yeah, I did yes. just ask you that. Do you know any hundred year old tennis tips that help? Uh, yes. All right. Very good. So I was out to lunch with Fred Earl, whose son Fritz coached at UCLA for 37 years. And Fred was one of the all-time great tennis teachers. He was friends with Tom Stowe. So he's 93 years old, and I was out to lunch with him with seven other pros. So I decided to ask him this question. Fred, what's the best tennis tip you ever gave anybody in your whole life? Right? And? Does it make you kind of, yeah, kind of makes yeah. you want to know what he said, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he said, oh, well, it's got to be bounce hit. So when you see the ball bounce, say bounce, and when you hit it, say hit. Well, since then I have eliminated, I've changed hit to toss because toss is not as tense and willful a word as hit. Okay. So, but that I digress. Anyway, so I said, oh, well that's great, Fred. I read about that in the inner game of tennis. So that's a tip from the seventies, right? And he said, no, that comes from the 1920s. Wow. Yes. So that is amazing because what it does is it brings all of your attention to two things that really, to the ball and the place where it will bounce mm -hmm. and your contact point. So, right. so those three things are a very large piece of being able to see the ball really well. And then Fred was also a master hypnotist. And so there's also sort of a light hypnosis that you go into when you start to become attuned to the rhythm of a tennis ball, you mm -hmm. know, bouncing and hitting your racket. It's, it sort of draws you in and that's sort of an entryway to the zone. I love it. Yeah. I love it. That's so, awesome. All right. All right. So, 
you mentioned early on that if people would like to have a consult with you, um, that you are available to that. Um, what's the offer? Let us know how to, how to. Oh, all right. Well, first off the, my book is available on Amazon. And so it's visual training for tennis. And, um, it's, I feel like there's a bullet point that I, maybe I didn't cover. We should probably do a little, we could do a few more questions. I'll do the, I'll do this. I want to, I want to try to extend this conversation a little bit cause we haven't gone a full hour, but anyway, so the book's on Amazon. Um, and then also if you send me an email and that's the day that this airs, this is a one day offer only, okay. then I will send a video called the top three common and catastrophic visual errors that people make and what to do instead. All right. And then not only that, but I will send a bonus PDF on, um, nutrition for your eyes. So this oh. is great, great for developing juniors so that they can develop good eyesight. Uh, it's great for performance and also for long-term maintenance for the sport of a lifetime. So you can avoid issues like macular de degeneration and cataracts and whatnot. Um, you know, of course, I am not a licensed nutritionist and you should consult people in regard to food allergies yes. and, and it's not to be deemed as medical advice. There are no guaranteed results. Caveat, 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 caveat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 you don't, right. you'd almost think yeah. you were the one married to the lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, no, it's fair warning because I wouldn't want um, anyone to expect, no. you know, something from it. But I have been on, you know, I've been actively eating the 10 different nutrients that most people haven't heard of mm -hmm. for a while. And it really has helped my vision considerably. So that's another piece to it. So, sure. cause there are, yeah, there are 10 different nutrients that make a huge difference. Um, and then also they, they're also things that support your brain and your, uh, and your general health. Um, because you know, they do, they were going to work on so many other parts of your body. Right. Sure, sure. So what was that worst possible visual performance yeah that's the i it's went back through me. your i went back through our bullet points um what was i and, thinking and that's the one i think that uh that we missed it's okay so do you have any other questions about visual training that you that you want to cover well i think you know the main thing is just that it is an important piece of the overall junior development puzzle right there it, it's not just about hitting forehands and backhands. It's not just about developing a, you know, good, consistent serve or return game. It's not just about developing your transition game to the net. There are other factors involved into in developing high level junior players and whatever high level means in your particular situation. Right. Oh, okay. So I have a story for you. All right. Okay. So I had, I had taken over the directorship of a club and and it had it had a good reputation as a junior program and and so i began to observe what was happening in the junior program and uh i can tell you i just really was not impressed uh -oh. and so so um so like you know i started to coach alongside the coaches that were doing that and one thing really struck me none of these players had an idea where their ideal contact point was. Hmm. So, so I was like, all right, Hey everybody, we're going to have a little special little time of discover your ideal contact point. Uh, because I can guarantee you every professional player knows where their ideal contact yeah. point is every single one of them. Right. And it's, it's partly predicated on their physique. It's part, it's partly predicated on their eye dominance. It's partly their hand dominance and what, what gripping style they're using because, you know, Western is going to be higher and closer and continental is going to be lower and farther away. And so, uh, but they had no awareness of it. And, mm. and one thing that I do often, one of the best practices in teaching is early on showing a player, okay, this is the ideal distance that you want to be from the ball in order to strike it. Mm. And so it's a game of, of 
you know, your opponent's going to try to make it so that you can't do that. And then you're going to fight really hard to get in that position. And the maestro of this is Federer. He is, he is yeah. so amazingly of able to get on balance for, you know, such a high percentage of his shots, you know, whereas you look at Rafa and Djokovic and they, they overcome, you know, a lesser ability in that way with overall athleticism. Right. So, and I mean, Serena has done the same thing. You know, right. it was her athleticism that allowed her to get away with somewhat sloppy contact points. But, um, you know, establishing that early on can really be a huge thing that sends people in the right direction. Then we go to footwork because it's your eyes that inform your footwork. So you have to know where you're going before you leave to go. And yeah. then and then then your feet are going to are going to be what gets you in position for that ideal contact point. Then you're going to be hitting the ball much more cleanly and injury free and you know all these different benefits. I mean, it's it's really amazing how a shot that's hit cleanly can easily be five to 10 more miles an hour faster than a ball that's not sure even even with exact same you know technique right but right. we're so technique focused we've we've lost quality control on how well we see the ball and arrive at the right place to hit the ideal shot yeah yeah well, Bill Patton, thank you so much for doing the podcast again. It's always thank a pleasure you. to chat with you. I always learn something new. And to those of you watching and listening, please, again, check the show notes for Bill's contact info, for info on how to take advantage of the offers that he's made to you, and uh, just to reach out to him with general questions. He's pretty responsive. So, um, Bill Wishing you all the best. Uh, now that I'm on the West Coast, maybe we'll actually get to meet in person one of these days. I feel like it's I gonna know happen. We've known each other for over ten years online, but um, yeah, I'll never be had in the Southern face California sometime this year, and I'll look you up and we'll for get sure. together. We'll meet Infinite, for coffee. Can, how about if I give my email? Yeah, please. Okay, Infinite Vision Coach at Gmail .com. and yeah, I'll I'll get back to you. You know, so send me a question. Um, and yeah, reach out for that video and for the, um, the PDF on nutrition. Perfect. Bill, thank you so much to my Thanks. listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll catch you next time on Parenting Aces.